الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. How's everybody on this cool evening? I am here to talk about knowledge, inshaAllah. And it's very, very important to understand the, the, the importance, the status of knowledge in Islam. Nowadays, unfortunately, what we've become is a fast food ummah. We want everything fast. We want weekend seminars. We want an hour-long lecture a week. And we expect to become scholars from that. But we look at the previous uh, nations, previous uh, times, and our pious predecessors, and they actually spent their whole lives in the seeking of knowledge, in the practicing of knowledge, and the disseminating of knowledge, spreading that knowledge that they had learned. So it's not something that we can say that we can learn in one hour or in one weekend but it is something that we need to be doing on a constant and a consistent basis. What is the purpose of knowledge? The purpose of knowledge is to develop a khashiyah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is the main purpose behind the knowledge. To get a closeness with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To understand Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To understand the weight of the Quran and the Sunnah in our lives. And that is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّمَا يَخْشَ Indeed, the ones who have the most khashiyah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the most fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, are the ulama, they are the scholars. So keeping that point in mind, if we are seeking any type of knowledge, and it is driving us away from recognizing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then that is not knowledge in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not regard that as knowledge, and neither should we. There are many people that through science, through scientific research, through medicine, through any kind of scientific field, they understand that there is a power that is greater than any one of us. And they understand through their scientific research, they realize that there is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And through that, they get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then there are others who through their research become atheists. So we can understand from this that anything that gets us closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes us understand His greatness. This is the knowledge that we should be seeking. This is what knowledge is. And that's why Allah says, in the inshallah, min ibadihi al-ulama. And we've probably heard this hadith many, many times before. The seeking of knowledge is obligatory upon every Muslim male and every Muslim female. You've heard that before, right? What does that mean and what does that entail? That means it's a fariba. Fariba means it's an obligation. We have to do it. Just like the five times daily salat, just like fasting in the month of Ramadan, just like performing hajj when we're supposed to, just like giving the zakat when we're supposed to, Similarly, seeking of knowledge is a fariqah. It's an obligation. What is an obligation? How much of it is an obligation? That's what we need to understand. So basically, for the lay person, for the common person, for uh, the average Joe, as they say, the knowledge that enables him to lead his daily life or her daily life as a Muslim, that is obligatory. Okay, so basically what do I need as a Muslim to lead my daily life? I need to know the rules and regulations of purification so I can keep my body pure, I can keep my clothes pure, I can pray with pure, uh, a pure body, I can keep my place of prayer pure and clean. As a Muslim, I need to know the rules and regulations of Salat because I'm praying uh, five times a lot daily. So therefore, I need to know the rules and the regulations. What are the arkan of the salat? What are the faraid of salat? What are the sunan of the salat? What things, if I leave them by mistake, if I leave them by mistake, my salat would be valid. And those things that I leave them by mistake, they would be covered by sajdat al-sahur. Those things that I leave 
They cannot be even recompensed by Sajda to Saul. I need to be fully aware of those things. To that level, every single Muslim male, every single Muslim female is obligated to learn these things. And if he or she does not know these things that he or she needs on a daily basis, then they are not fulfilling the fariba that is obligatory upon them. Now, let's say somebody wants to start a business. Now, as a business person, I'm a Muslim, he needs to also now learn the masail, the rules and regulations that are associated with the business in question. What can I sell? What can I, what I, what can't I sell? What is halal for me to do in this business? What is halal for me to do in this business? What is a gray area and what is clear and what is, what is ambiguous? All of these things, because you as a Muslim are going to start, now it becomes obligatory for you to learn the masail and the rules and regulations which are associated with that business. That's why in the time of Umar ibn Khattab uh, Umar didn't used to allow anybody to do business until he had excelled in learning the rules and regulations that were related to business. Let's say somebody wants to get married in the next week, in the next month. As a husband, he needs to learn the rules and regulations of being a husband. What the rights of his wife are. What his responsibilities are as a husband. He needs to learn and know that he is obligated to provide shelter, food, clothing for his wife. <coughs> and for his children in the future, how he's supposed to give them tarbiya. He needs to learn this before stepping into this into this field of marriage which is something that needs to be learned it's not something that you just download you know it's something that you learn <coughs> similarly a wife a woman when she's about to get married she needs to learn the rights of her husband what her responsibilities are as a wife so it becomes obligatory for her because now this thing is going to be something that she's going to be dealing with as a Muslim. It becomes obligatory for her to learn this. So basically, put this hadith in that context that I've just mentioned now. The seeking of knowledge is felt on every Muslim male and every Muslim female to the degree that whatever you need to know about on a daily basis, you need to know about it. It is obligatory upon you to learn it. That's what this hadith means. So it's important for us to understand this. And then there's a higher level of knowledge. And that level of knowledge, it's what, what's known as Fard Kifaya. And it is, what does Fard Kifaya mean? Fard Kifaya means that if some people in the community are fulfilling that obligation, then everybody else are basically free from that responsibility. Just like the Salat al-Janazah. It's fun of kifayat that if some people in the community pray Janazah on somebody, then everybody else are basically included and safe. So there is a second level of knowledge which is fun of And that is having a scholar in your midst. Every community needs to have a scholar in their midst that on a day-to-day -day basis if they come up with something that they're not aware of something unique something that they haven't learned about then they can refer to the scholar an issue of divorce comes up an issue of uh, the rules of the nikah come up you know things of that nature which only a scholar usually knows about and usually only a scholar studies that person, uh, you have to have at least one person in the community who can keep, who can bridge this gap, who can, uh, you know, fulfill the needs of the community when those needs arise. So that's Fault Kifaya. And Alhamdulillah, you have Sheikh Yusuf in your community. 
but there are many, many communities across the U.S. that do not have this luxury of having an imam. And this is very, very important to understand also. The Prophet ﷺ said a very, very alarming hadith about things that will happen before the Day of Judgment. He said, Inna Allah la yantazi'u la ilma intiza'an Allah SWT is not going to just snatch away knowledge suddenly that one day you wake up and knowledge is all gone. But he said, وَلَكِنْ يَقْبِضُ الْعِلْمِ بِقَبْضِ الْعُلَمَاء But slowly, slowly, the ulama, the true scholars, are going to fade away. They're going to pass away. And then, what's going to happen is, إِتَّخَذَ النَّاسُ وَأَسَى جُهَالًا People are going to take juhal, ignorant people, as leaders. These people are going to be asked questions and they're going to give fatwas without knowledge. They're going to give fatwas without knowledge. They themselves are going to be astray and they're going to lead other people astray also. And this is actually what we're seeing, especially in this country, that there are so many masajid in this country and there are so few Imams to lead them. If I was to ask you, for example, how many Imams can you name that are on a, on a national level known to be scholars? You can probably count maybe 10 or 15 or 20 known scholars that are renowned for their knowledge and for their uh, ability to lead and for their ability to teach people. So what about the 2,000 or so decided that are remaining? So it's very, very important for us to understand that there's a huge shortage of scholars and this, if we regard it as being one of the signs of the Day of Judgment, that people are just putting anybody to lead the community, then it's, it's an alarming thing. It's something we need to be worried about. Also keep in mind that the Prophet ﷺ he used to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with a very specific dua. He used to say, Allahumma inni as'aluka ilman nafi'an wa amanam taqabbala wa rizqan wasi'an wa shifa'an min kulidah. Oh Allah, I ask you for beneficial knowledge and amal which is accepted and risk which is vast and a dua which is accepted. And he used to ask for refuge, Allah's refuge from what? Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min ilmin la yinfa Allah, I ask your refuge from that knowledge which does not benefit wa nafsin la tashba' and a nafs, a soul that is never satiated wa qalbin la yaksha' and a heart which does not have the the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in it or does not have the khushu' of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in it wa dua illa yusma and dua which are not heard by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but the main point that I want to focus on is ilm al What is ilm al What is beneficial knowledge? <coughs> beneficial knowledge is that knowledge that which a person <coughs> learns, practices, and then propagates. There are three responsibilities for a person with knowledge. Learning the knowledge itself <coughs> and learning it properly, practicing it, and then thirdly, propagating it. Disseminating that knowledge, teaching people that don't know it. These are the responsibilities of a, a, of a person who seeks knowledge, and this is what is known as ilmun nafi. This is what the Prophet ﷺ was asking for, and he was seeking refuge from that knowledge which is not beneficial. That knowledge that a person doesn't practice, that knowledge that a person doesn't propagate and teach others. So it becomes the responsibility of the scholars to understand this concept of ilm al nafi and ilm which is not beneficial. So how do we learn this knowledge? First and foremost, we need to, you know, we need to actually stop wasting time first and foremost. Many of us are wasting so many time, so much time in so many things. Okay, on the internet, watching TV, watching movies, movies. My whole khutbah today actually in Irving Masjid was the importance of time. It's such a, such a, a shame that we have to do things that 
do not benefit us in this world, nor benefit us for the hereafter. We hear people using the phrase, well, I'm just killing time. Killing time. As if time is something that is so useless that you just kill it. No. Time is so beneficial to us. Time is so precious to us. That is more valuable than money. Some people use this phrase, time is money. Well, we say that time is more valuable than money. Why is that? If I was to ask you, in return for the whole world, the riches of the whole world, all the money, all the gold, all the silver, all the diamonds, all the rubies, all the emeralds, everything. If I was to give that to you and you give me back the year 2012, would you be able to give that back to me? No. Would you be able to give me back one month of 2012? How about one week? How about one day? How about one hour? How about one minute? In return for the whole world and whatever it contains, can you give that to, uh, one minute back to me? So it seems that money is even more precious, time is even more precious than money. But we have to realize the value of that time. There are so many distractions nowadays. And we have to avoid those distractions. We have to focus on goals that we set for ourselves. Goals that I'm going to, for example, memorize one juice in the next three months. I'm going to memorize so many hadith in the next two months. On a daily basis, I'm going to do X, Y, and Z deeds every single day. Setting these goals for ourselves. And all of these things actually are things that you find in these you know these people who teach time management? All of these things, and these people teach it from a, from a worldly perspective, that how you can improve your business, how you can improve your corporate life, and all of that stuff. We have a bigger goal. We have a bigger agenda. And our agenda is the hereafter. How can I improve my hereafter? We look and we look about what the previous scholars used to say, uh, the Tabi'in and the Sahaba used to say, Hassan al-Basri, he said a very beautiful thing. He said, you, O human, O son of Adam, you are a collection of your life. You are, a, you are basically uh, an accumulation of your life is you. When a day passes, part of you diminishes. When a week part passes, then another part of you diminishes. When a month passes, more of you diminishes. Basically what it means is that you as an entity, you as a body, are getting less and less and less. Your life is diminishing. The second hand that you see ticking slowly, tick tock, tick tock, it is getting you closer to your death. So. It's amazing that people celebrate birthday parties. You know why? You blow out cakes, the, the, the candle on the cakes. So you're 80 years old, you put the candles and you light the candles. The blowing out of the candles, it signifies the 18 years of life have just blown away. You didn't know that. So you make a wish at that time. No, the signif significance of blowing out of the candles is that 18 years of your life have gone. Just like, just like a breath, it's gone. We need to keep that point in mind. I'm just drifting away from the subject. But the point is that we need to make sure that we value the time that we have and to utilize it in learning something. And we need to make sure that on a daily basis we set targets for ourselves. We set goals for ourselves. And this is an ideal opportunity for you, everybody here, uh, to enroll into the courses at SUFA and to utilize the, the services available for you. The Prophet ﷺ, he used to tell people to ask if they didn't know something that took place in the time of the Prophet, that a person, he had an injury. Uh, people were traveling, he got an injury, and at the same time, he had to take an obligatory ghusl. He needed to take a shower, which was obligatory. 
the people around him said, no, 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 you have to take a shower. So he took a shower, that wound that he had became even more infected, and he died. The Prophet ﷺ was so upset when he heard about this. He said, قَتَلُوهُ قَتَلَهُمُ Allah. They killed him. May Allah destroy them. Allah. Can you imagine that? Why did they ask somebody if they didn't know? Why didn't they ask somebody if they didn't know? Because the cure for jahal, the cure for ignorance is asking. That's what Allah says in the Quran. فَاسْأَلُوا أَهْلَ ذِكْرِ إِن كُنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ Ask the people of knowledge if you yourself don't know. So asking people of knowledge basically is tantamount to sitting in a class, taking courses, learning from scholars, learning from qualified people. This is how knowledge is to be sought. This is the true way of seeking knowledge. And unfortunately, like I said, we, we want everything like we want our fast food. Quickly, but unfortunately, that quick thing that we do, quick fast food, it's not necessarily the best for our health. Quick knowledge that we try to attain through Google or whatever it is, that is not necessarily bad for, uh, good for our spirit. It's not good for our spiritual nourishment. It's bad for our spiritual nourishment because we have no kind of uh, knowledge as to where we are getting this knowledge from. Who is the one writing this fatwa? Who is the one writing and putting up this website that I'm getting my information from? Only a person who has knowledge can basically gauge where, where this site is from. Who is putting up this website? Who is the one who is writing these fatwas? So, you know, we need to get away from that understanding, that concept of getting this quick knowledge, this Google knowledge or Yahoo knowledge, and sitting in a classroom the traditional way and attaining knowledge from traditional scholars who are qualified to give us that knowledge. And so far, inshallah, is one of the ways that this community has had in the you know, within the masjid for a long time, I would urge everybody to utilize it to, to the best of their uh, abilities and to benefit from it the most that they can. I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives me and you and everyone the tawfiq to understand and practice what has been said about.